So we're talking about transition and how to get ourselves out of jams. All right. Beach volley ball. Man, I loved that talk. All right. So good. It looks like we're going to have our first, maybe our first transition opportunity here. All right. This is my match with Ian Satterfield against Ty Loomis and Michael Brunson. Okay. I'm coming for the inside set. Ty Loomis makes a lovely move here. Sits in the middle of the court, which I do recommend being centralized as a defender. Make sure that you're hovering around the middle of the court. We don't want to play perimeter because if you're playing on the perimeter, you're going to be too far away from the rest of the court to get a good scoop. Right? You want to centralize yourself. So here, he's not really telling me with his body clearly if he's going to end up in the diagonal or the line. I play more off of Mike, and I see this small space here. Because Ty is centralized, he's able to make a quick move to that ball and covers this shot. And he also probably has a scouting report on me. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, we got a block. No, we got a, a double something. All right. So Ty gets a dig. And this is what we're talking about here, right? We're in trouble. Ty centralizes himself, putting himself close to the majority of the court. All right. And he gets that dig. That's a great read. He knows I'm going down this way, and I'm bringing it back cross because of the shoulder position that I have rotating. Once he passes, he passes. That ball's going to end up straight in front of him. So if you see where that ball is going to end up, here's Ty's body. And then, hey, okay, that ball's going to end up pretty much straight on his body. So his job in transition is to set himself up as if it were serve receive. So. If you guys have ever been a part of one of my offensive programs, you know that we like to create space. As a right-handed, left-side hitter, we like to create a hitting window, and that's exactly what Ty does. So he digs to the front half of the court, and then look at that window creation. Leaves so much space for his right arm and sets himself up. Now, after a dig out of the middle of the court, Ty and Mike look like they're in serve-receive. Right? Uh, they've redesigned their offense so that they're looking like it's their everyday serve receive pattern. And he creates this big space for, the, for his right shoulder. And then Mike is going to lay it inside the right shoulder. We don't see this out of a lot of amateur players. We don't see people going outside these lines. Somehow they act as a boundary and people don't like to go outside them. But you'll see professionals do it all the time. Set themselves up for the proper hit. All right, so Ty gets outside of that court, gets a good look at me. I'm trying to stay centralized and gets that nice cut shot. All right, caught us off balance. I don't like that stop pattern and I don't like my late movement. But great setup by Ty and Mike. Okay, ooh, another transition situation. Okay, so I come in for this hit. Mike gets a block touch. You know, as there's a lot of players out there that should not be blocking. So this won't apply to everybody. But if you do block and you do get a touch, I always get that question and there's always that argument of, hey, should I get that or should my partner get that? And my answer is always both of you. You have to go for that ball. You have to pursue it because you don't always know what your partner is thinking or if they know where the ball is. So your first instinct has to be, let me get to the ball first. And if I hear somebody bark louder, then they'll take it over. Ideally, in this situation where he gets a block touch and it goes close to the net, Ty is in a much better position to hit because they need to now set and hit. So Ty's coming forward at the net. He's going to have the best opportunity at vision. So Mike should pursue this. The blocker should pursue this after the block touch and lay it up because the person in the back of the court is going to have that vision. Okay. That being said, it's both partners' responsibility to go for it until somebody clearly says mine or is under control. All right. So after that block touch, Mike hopefully realizes where Ty's right arm is. All right. And he should lay it somewhere up in here. Ty might be saying something like straight up, straight up on you. 
right? And he pushes it a little bit too far. And we see that kind of little awkward position where the ball's going just past Taish, uh right shoulder. But he gets himself, no, he doesn't quite get himself out of it. Yeah. So Mike set the ball a little bit too far, but it's a good play in transition. Anyway, moving on to another transition play. Ian digs the ball back there. Okay. Once he digs the ball in the back of the court, even though we're not in a situation that we like to be in, we're not in our normal serve-receive pattern anymore, he has to set himself up to hit. My job as a setter, your job as a setter, if you are a setter, your job is to get the ball to the kill zone. Kill zone is anywhere from three to six feet from the net. I don't care. <laughs> I don't. Sorry, I hate when people say I don't care. You should not be worried as much how far from the net your partner is. You, if they're in the back of the court or they're hanging out at three quarters depth, you got to say, go to the net because that's where I'm going to put the ball. I need, I, I'm the setter. My job is to get us back into the kill zone and that's close to the net. So Ian has to anticipate, even though we're in trouble here, Ian has to anticipate that I'm going to try to get the ball to the net. Then my second job once we're in the kill zone is to try to hunt down his right arm and feel where his right arm is. Again, I set his left here, didn't do a great job of getting it to his right arm, so he's not going to be in a great position. But I get him to the net. He trusts that I'm going to do that. Mike's turn in transition. And this is one of my favorite positions okay, for teaching purposes. kind of hate this position as a player. Mike Brinsting over here dug the ball to the back line. And I'm gonna draw a small map for you guys, okay? I wish I had the, the ability or the knowledge or the program to do lines on the screen. If anybody wants to come and teach me, I'm open to it. But this court is divided, we're gonna say in half, this way, and then in thirds. Hmm? Hmm. Okay, so now imagine that we have six areas on the court. Front half, back half, and then cut in two thirds. Mike dug to the back middle third. When the ball is out there, Mike creates a giant triangle so that he's going and hopefully he's gonna let the ball pass him and then he's going to chase it and go forward. If he gets himself in front of the ball or off sides, he's gonna end up looking backwards when he should be looking at the court. And he's going to have a blind swing and he's going to be forced to listen to his partner, which if you've taken any of my lessons, listening to your partner is your plan B if you don't have the skill developed to look at the court. Okay, So he's in plan B situation if he gets in there too early, but he has vision if he lets the ball pass in front of him. So tie setting from the back middle of the court. Mike is outside the court and he should be saying something like, outside he's created enough of a triangle so ty is going to push it slightly to the antenna he's not going to drag this into the middle all right let's see what he does yep gets that outside set okay so back middle of the court outside mike screaming outside ty's job is to get him to the kill zone you will see this all the time players pass to the back line and then they stay with their setter like we used to in indoor where it's, oh, I got to help the person who's diving. We got to be full athletes in beach volleyball. That's not offensive. That's probably offensive to indoor players. <laughs> Used to be an indoor <laughs> player. It's totally cool. But that setter's job is completely to get you back to the net, to get you to the kill zone. So you can't chase the person who is running after a set. Your job is to wait at the net or in your point of hesitation so that they can put it at the net. Okay? Mike calls outside because this ball is in the back middle of the court. If this ball, Ty resetting from here. Can you see my little play button there? Okay. So if Ty resetting from here, the back uh, right third, and Mike were a left-handed player, he would get further outside. And we'd still be in an outside set so that Mike creates the triangle. If Ty were back over here, then you can also call middle. And then Mike could position himself just slightly inside the court, right? The wider the triangle, though, 
the more we're going to have vision, the more you can let the ball get in front of you and you can see the defense. So if we're here setting from the back middle, we call outside. If we're setting from your back, right, the one closest to you, you say outside. If you dig or pass the ball to the back third of the court that's furthest away from you, you can call middle or outside. The advantage of calling middle is that you keep the set a little bit smaller. It's a little bit easier to aim, right? Outside, though, you might have a bigger court to hit at. So you can um, have a hard angle swing, right? As opposed to just a couple of over shorts, right? If he gets the set out of the middle, then he doesn't have as big an area to attack. So again, if he's setting from here, middle, then maybe outside. Setting from here, for sure, outside. Put it three feet from the antenna. Setting from here, outside. Put it three feet from the antenna, and the hitter's job is to position himself just like that. All right, didn't quite get the set to the net, but we're moving on. Let's look for the next dig. Yay, got another dig. Centralized position here, right? I'm not playing the perimeter. If they hit the last two feet of the court, let them have it. Happy birthday. You did it. You, you beat me on the last 18 inches of the court. But that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the other 90% where I can get most of my digs. Okay. So I get a little read here on tie. Maybe, mm, yeah, a little read slash a four. But I get this dig. I put the ball to the front of the court. And now I'm running a sprint vision offense. This is a little bit beyond most of us. But if you have the control and the ability to do this, you can catch a blocker very off balance. So once I dug this high line, normally we'd like to just go around and relax. Mm, my theory is that I like to be able to put blockers off balance. If you're playing against people who aren't blocking, don't bother with this. It's not going to put them off balance. So I go ahead and I come around and I sprint quick and we're going for a low set. Right? Mike caught up nicely. I didn't get it around him. I got better at this during the season though, all right? He's a little bit off balance, makes a good rebalance move. Ian does the same method. He gets his cover dig, and then he's spreading quickly to the pin, again, trying to get Mike off balance. I slowed it down a little bit too much, but we got, yeah, I slowed it down a little bit too much for Ian. All right, here we go. So we got our dig. There's Mike's pass, has a nice hitting window for his left arm. Ty's job is to try to leave it within this window. So they're not in a great serve. He pushes it a little bit too far, which gives me a defensive advantage because I see that ball coming over his right shoulder. So I start bailing on it. This is me playing a read defense. All right, barely get my hands on it, but it's up enough. And I dig it high enough so that Ian can get his hands on it and that I have time. So Ian can relax as a setter. I don't shovel it low to him. I get high enough above the antenna so that we have time to reset. Ian's job is not to feel me on the ground and say, all right, I'll set it to where you are. I'm going to put it at half court. His job, because he's a good setter, is to get the ball to the net. My job is to get my ass up and get to the net so that I can get to the kill zone. All right. If I'm on the ground, if your hitter's on the ground and you're a setter, you have two options to control that play or to slow it down. Option one, actually you have three options. Option one is to wait longer and set from a lower crouched position. Each couple inches that you let the ball drop, you've created more time before we have to set. Okay, so you can crouch lower and contact lower on the set. Even six inches will give your partner a little bit extra time to make sure that they can come back and get ready in time. Option two is to create, if you're a hand setter, just a little bit longer, deeper hands. Some people have very quick hands, but some people have the ability to sort of slow down time within their hands. I know Brandon used to be able to do that very well, still does that very well as an indoor setter. He would allow his middles to catch up by slowing down his hands or letting the ball come in deeper like this, not deeper like this, but deeper with the hands and then releasing to create just an extra split second and regain time. Option three is just set higher. But no matter what, there are no options that say, I'm going to set you at half court, right? Because we're getting to the kill zone. 
and there we go. So let's watch that whole play again. It's, it's me doing well, so I want to show you guys that. <laughs> All right, get a little read on it, make the dig. He gets me to the net, even though I'm on the ground, and then we get that seam kill. That would be bad if that camera didn't fix for the rest of the time. Okay, another great. So even though this is serve receive, this can seem like a dig, okay? And they do a really good job of getting themselves back into system. Right? We will call this a transition situation, even though it's serve receive, because we're out of system. So Mike gets a rough pass, but Ty sprints to it, slows himself down, creates a long contact on the set for the last two steps. So I want you to see how his speed changes. He gets sprint mode and then long at the very end. There's a very distinct time change or speed change in his pattern. So check it out. Low, long. Did you see that? See that little last pause on the giant lunge? Okay. He creates a long situation so that he can be accurate at the very end. Fast first, but don't just sprint through and hit. Fast, 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 long, and then set. Check it out again. Long. See how he sort of pauses his own body on that last step one more time. Big time sprint. Nice. Here's what I love about Mike. This is how you know he's a professional, right? Runsting gets a bad pass. Does not start chasing his setter. Does not start charging the net. Runsting trusts that Ty Loomis, AVP champion, can get him to the net even when he's diving. And that's the faith that we need to put in all of our setters. And that's the expectation we need to have. Because if we have low expectations for them and we just chase them or we expect them to set it at half court, they're never going to get it to the net. And we're never going to get a kill in this situation. We're just going to keep it alive. And that's not enough to win tournaments. Keeping it alive is not enough to win tournaments. It's enough to get you out of pool. Don't make errors. Don't make errors. But at some point, you got to get kills in transition situations. So he waits here. You see that? He's saying, go, go, go but his body is staying calm and he's in a hitting position, expecting Ty to get him to the net. He also doesn't chase Ty, he doesn't charge the net. He says, go, and I'm gonna wait for you to set me perfect. He's got high expectations of the setter, which is what makes him a professional. Boom, and his setter does the job and they get the kill from it. If he had charged the net early or if he had just panicked and ran or said like, oh, poop, pass bad. Uh, not going to happen. You're not going to get that kill, but they got themselves out of a bind there because he stayed calm, said, go, go, go on the net. And that's how we get those kills. All right. So good transition situation where we have a run through setter who sprints, slows himself down. And then the hitter who, even though he's in trouble, he expects a great set. All right. Here's another one. Right, it's serve receive, but we're in a transition situation. So don't get a great pass. Or Ian was actually trying to set me on two here. But now I'm facing backwards, right? And Ian can recognize that I'm in trouble and chase me and get nervous, or he can expect me to find him because that's my job as a setter again, to find him. So even though I'm turned around, I'm hoping that Ian talks to me, but my job as a setter is to remember the last place that I saw him. And if I can remember that, then I should know about where his right arm is, and I'm trying to force that to the right arm. So if your setter doesn't talk and you're blind, the setter's job, sorry, if the hitter doesn't talk and the setter is blind, the setter's job is to remember where the hitter was and say, okay, that's the last place I saw him, so that's where I'm going to put the set, on his right arm. Okay, super important. Ian stays composed, right, waits back, stays at half court. My job is to find it. Even though I'm diving and doing something crazy, we're expecting that we're gonna get that kill. So we set ourselves up to do it. This is the last one. All right, we we'll finally get a dig out of here. It's centralized in the court. Make a little adjustment step, small rebalance. But notice, I can't even reach the sideline from where I'm standing. So defensively, stay centralized, guys. You're gonna get a lot more balls hit at you. And if they, again, if they hit the last 18 inches of the court, let them have it. And if they keep doing that, then they deserve the match, really. Um, or you'll have to make a defensive adjustment before they win the match. But we get a dig here. It's in the front half of the court or about half court, which is pretty good. 
since I dug him a little bit off the net, I'm not going to get in line with him like I usually do as a right side. So now I'm asking push, push. If I pass that ball really forward from 10 feet, then I could get in line with him as a right side. But right now I'm saying push because that tells him I don't want him to put it in the middle. I also don't want him to throw it outside to the antenna. I just am giving him a sense of where my right arm is, but I'm in his peripheral here, so he has to know as a setter where my right arm is, okay? He gets it out and over my right, and I'm in that slinky position that we talked about with Dr. Dom, um, trying to fight out of that. But he does a good job of getting it to my right, and I stayed calm after the dig. I didn't charge the net, right? Dig and don't rush. Everybody gets so excited after a dig that they rush, but you can see that I walk on that first step. Dig, calm now. Right, left, bah, bah, and get forward. Ty gets another one, out. Nice, too much heat, Ty Loomis. 